Hello. Hi. Hi. So first of all, for listeners who don't know, um, what is a chain walla? Uh, a chain walla is somebody who fixes broken zippers on the streets. Right. So. And so what what's this person's status then? What is their what is their social situation? And it, it's um it's almost as low as you can get. Right. I mean, it's not I didn't get into to cast issues here. We're not talking about untouchability or dalit or anything like that necessarily. Uh, they may be one step above that. I'm not sure in the case of this film. I didn't want to go into it, but it's as as labor as you can get. I right. mean, it's a really low level job. Mm-hmm. So the family has very limited resources yeah. and very very limited access to power, and then you place them in this very horrible situation mm-hmm. in the film. Their son, um, the family needs money. Mm-hmm. Um, they send the son away to work for a month to yeah. earn some extra money for the family. They they love their son very much, mm-hmm. but they need to do this to keep the family going, um, and he disappears. Mm-hmm. Uh, I heard that this was actually based on a true story or a story that was told to you. Uh, t- can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah. It was, I was uh, in Delhi in 2010, and uh, I was in a rickshaw um, with a fellow, and he asked me for help to try and find his missing son. And when he told me the details uh, of exactly he sent his boy away to, to Punjab to work, uh, he never heard from him again. He d- uh, doesn't have a photograph of his son. He doesn't know how to spell his son's name. He uh, doesn't know what the Internet is. So the specific piece of information he was asking me which is where Dongri is, because he believed his son was kidnapped and taken to a place called right. Dongri. And Dongri is, is in the film. In the, the, film. the father goes to Dongri to search for his son in the film. Exactly. Um, he had been asking people for one year who got into his rickshaw if they knew where Dongri was. I was the first person who had access to the internet and found it in five seconds. Um, in a year? In a year. Um, and he had to go to work. He had no choice. He didn't have a grieving period. He didn't have the luxury of taking the time off. He couldn't even search for Dongri because he had to support his family. So that's kind of where it all started. I couldn't help the guy. It had been too long since his boy had been lost, and I tried to find him, and it was a bit of a mess. But uh, this was the next best thing I could do. And when did you start thinking about making this as a a narrative film uh, as opposed to a documentary, Mm -hmm. perhaps? I mean, I am am more of a narrative filmmaker, um, and it was about a year later. I was working on a different film, and this just incident kept haunting me. And I felt it, it would be more penetrating to actually get into the mindset of this person, uh, rather than just profile the incident as, as a child trafficking father looking for a kid. To me, what was more interesting and I think needed to be done, we've, we've seen films about trafficking. We kind of seen visual representations of what happens to these children sometimes. Um, what I wanted to know is is the type of mindset that basically is living in the, in the Stone Age and may be very intelligent. So, so what's happening in our society if, uh, obviously at the risk of grossly generalizing, uh, if you have people like this, he, he may have integrity, he may be super intelligent, but because of limitations far before he was even born, uh, he doesn't have a fighting chance to find this kid. Well, and I read that uh, that you and the the main actor who plays the yeah, father, Rajesh, Taylor. Rajesh, yeah, uh, that you really had to work hard not to infuse your own maybe logic or morality mm. or understanding on it. Um, what was that process like when you were writing the film and then shooting it, um, when you saw the father um, having to make different choices because of his lack of resources than other parents or other people might think that they would make? Yeah, you know, it, it, that, that, that was a real, that actually the real f- challenge and the real fun in this. It, the whole point was to explore a different way of thinking. All of the reference points of this chain walla in his life are different from our, ours. Uh, everything he's seen... And everything he knows in the world is different. So the choices he makes may be different. Um, now, can that be alienating to an audience here in the West and in Canada? Of course. I think it can really be abrasive. Why are we watching this person do these things? So we first tried to do it in subtle ways. So, for example, um, when he, it happens to me all the time. Somebody will call me when I'm in India and say, who is this? And I say, what do you mean, who is this? You called me. You, have you not learned telephone etiquette? This guy doesn't know telephone etiquette. Because they went from nothing to cell phones. They didn't have landlines like we did for 100 years. Um, so they don't know the etiquette. So we would show things like that. And You also show his young daughter showing him how to use the phone exactly. to take a photograph. Exactly. So little, little points of reference where we can kind of find our way in. That, okay, this is different from us. Like a litmus test. Now the bigger decisions start to come in. Of Wait a sec. He's, what is his plan? Is he going to go to Bombay, to Dongri, and literally just wander the streets? Is that his plan? By that point, I think, I hope we're on, on side because we just want this to work so much. Well, one thing I think is really interesting that you do as well is that 
you confound expectations at every turn. So uh, the father, Mahendra, goes to the police, and there is this kind of officiousness that he's met with at first. Um, by a woman. By a woman. So is, it's a female yeah. police officer. Yeah. Um, and at one point, she begins to blame him to a degree. You know, you people, this happened. You should have sent mm -hmm. your son to school. Why did you send your son to, to, to work? But then later on in the film, she shows up, and she's actually done a lot of work yeah, to try to help him. Yep. Um, were you conscious, too, of not... Like, it feels like every time people could get a handle on a particular character or a situation in India, I felt like you then confounded expectations. Yeah. that was one of the points of the film. Again, uh, Rajesh had said it. He goes, uh, we have to move against the stereotypes. Uh, he said that was the call of this film. And I totally agree. It was uh, his idea to make that character a female. I had written it as a male. And we changed nothing. We just cast a female. Um, so I one of the things I wanted to do, again, we've seen so many cases, films in India, dramas, where you have somebody who's uh, maybe poor going to somebody for help, and then they take advantage of them. And we see that, and it's gut-wrenching. And I wanted to show, well, what is, what is like, what if everyone helps this guy? What if, every, what if the worst he's met with is indifference, and the best he's met with is actual compassion all the way through? He's, does he still have a chance? So the film to me is so much about that type of compassion. I, that's why I didn't want to show what's happening to the child. I wanted to show as positive a light as possible on the people in that environment. And the tragedy that we feel is infused by our knowledge of the world. Well, and I also think sometimes uh, that there is a sense when people, you know, cast people here uh, in the West cast nine on on India. And I think that when it w when looking at sort of poverty or looking at poor areas, there's kind of a, a dehumanizing impact. Yes. It sort of is a mass of people as yep. opposed to individual characters. Yeah. Um, and uh, within the film, you make a point of having each character, even if they're only on screen briefly, um, have a whole whole backstory yes. to them, it seems. Yes. And again, Rajesh really helped with that because he wrote the Hindi dialogue in the film. I wrote the film as English. So what you read was what I wrote. But then he started coming in with, you know what, let's make it so that this food stand guy has this little bit of an attitude. Uh, let's make it so that that traffic cop is actually maybe even having an affair with that with that other with that female cop, and they joke about it. Things like that, where it's like let's let's bring more life, and then we started going back and forth on that. It was so important to bring life because that to me is the point of the film. Um, one of my favorite scenes personally in the film is when he's at the train station. And he talks to these two street vendors about a, a price of a ticket to Bombay, and one guy's like, "I wish I could go to Bombay," and the older guy's like, "You well, think you're a movie star?" And these are like street bustlers. <laughs> And, and that to me, I, I love that. And it's actually the point of the film is to spend time with these people. I want a viewer who would normally, if you go to India and you walk the streets, you might be alienated by these people because they look gr scruffy and they don't smile when they look at you. They just kind of look stone-faced. And you might say, okay, uh, not, I don't want to see that person. I want you to spend time with them because 99% of the 1.2 billion people there are wonderful. And even if 1% is really, really rotten, it's a huge number. That's rotten. Well, and I thought it was very interesting that even in the the, the film is this very you know tragic sense of foreboding. I mean, this mm -hmm. little boy mm -hmm. is missing, and the father first has to get money to go to where he was to mm -hmm. see if he can. So at every turn, there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but there was also there's some humorous bits mm -hmm. in the film. Um, there's actually quite a romantic little set piece between he and his wife as he's training her mm -hmm. to fix the chains while he goes away to fix the zippers and the chains while he goes sure. away, and it's actually quite. Lovely, the way it's shot, and they're smiling at one another, even though their son is missing. Mm -hmm. So why did you make that choice to include those moments of, of humor or levity or connection within this bigger story of a missing child? Because I remember when I was pitching this film uh, to try and get it off the ground, I would say, you know, have you seen Taken? Yeah, of course. Okay, now imagine he's not an ex-CIA agent. He's an illiterate laborer in Delhi. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the first... Step, premise, um, this is not a, a, a you have 96 hours to find your kid before we slit their throat. This is taking place over a month, maybe even six weeks. So in that time, you're going to encounter humor. You're going to encounter moments of levity. Nobody can sustain that type of period just being depressed, especially when you need to keep yourself motivated. So uh, I think we've all been in those places where you have a tough time for a period of time. You're going to laugh at some point. Um, and I also don't feel... I'm doing a service to the audience. If a film starts low and then goes lower and lower and lower and lower and lower with no respite, 
Um, I think it's easy to do that. I think it's easy to do that in a place like India, where we can just wallow on the streets and say, look how terrible this is. What's more challenging and more beneficial is to show that these people have a sense of humor, that they sing, that they have so much, um, they have so much soul to them. They have poetry to them. Um, that, that was a challenge. You mentioned that uh, you wrote the script in English, mm-hmm. and then the lead actor um, uh, helped to translate it into Hindi. Mm-hmm. What was the, what was that like? I'm trying to imagine directing. I don't know if you speak Hindi or understand I it. Do, yeah. Okay, so w- but was it? Uh, were, did you feel like you were able to get all the inflection and the weight, or sometimes were you thinking, I'm not sure if they're landing that line exactly the way that I want it? Because, or how did that how did that work? No, I I'm, I mean I'm completely fluent in the language, uh-huh. so that that wasn't a challenge at all. Um, there is a difference between being fluent in a language and being able to write poetically in it. So in that way, Rajesh, who is actually a linguist and he teaches diction um, in the National School of Drama in, in Delhi, he's the expert at this. Um, so we would go back and forth. I mean, each line we would work out together in a way so that there was no surprises we got on set. But there's nothing anyone says that I don't understand. There's no inflection I don't get. There's no, I mean, in that way, I was completely in, in tune which is also why for me going back to India is so important because I happen to, I mean, learning the language was a gift that my grandmother gave me. And I happen to have access now to a whole different stratas of worlds, which there's no way I would if I was just sticking around here and I didn't speak that language. So I have to use it. Well, so you were born and raised here in Mississauga. Um, did you ever imagine when you first were thinking about, a, a, you know, working in film and, and becoming a filmmaker that you would make your films and that you would go to India? To no, it? never. It never even occurred to me. So what is the pull then about, about, uh, about setting this in the, in the previous one there? I can't, um, I can't help it, actually. Uh, I had gone to India when I was 16 for the first time since I was a baby. Uh, I had so many issues um, coping um, coming to an understanding of what that place was, the issues that were there, uh, how how well we had it. I mean, Mississauga is a very safe and pleasant and happy place, uh, generalizing again. And um, and so I said I would never go back unless I could address some of these, th- these things. I didn't think it would be through film work. And then when Amal came along as an opportunity, it became a way to do that. And so I addressed it. And as I was l- doing, kind of finishing the one project, Siddharth happened, that incident. And then as I'm finished, I was finishing Siddharth, another thing happened. And now my next film, maybe my next two films will be there. I can't help it. It keeps happening and it keeps building into not, not just a canon of work, but now I'm developing um, a, a, ver- a, a long-term point I'm trying to make about all kinds of things. Right. And it seems to be like, it, Delhi seems to be a place that this is happening for me. And I want to talk a bit about how, how where a film like Siddharth sits within India's uh, cinematic tradition, whether mm-hmm. it's because um, I don't, I don't know if you consider yourself a, an Indian filmmaker or how mm. do you, you know the work. The work is set there. This sort of set within that tradition. Mm-hmm. So, so where does it sit within within the traditions of Indian you cinema? Know, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say because there is definitely a tradition of independent cinema now, uh, and even in the past there has been um, a lot of my favorite films don't have the musical numbers and don't have what we call masala, which is all the, the craziness. Um, I will say that the Masala films in the 70s and 80s uh, were always centered around social issues. They still had all the pizzazz, uh, and those are the films that I watched growing up. Um, So there definitely is a tradition of this type of film. Um, Now, by and large, they call them art films, and the label of an art film in India is death, um, in terms of no distributor will even touch it. So I have a lot of friends who are, live in India who do films in a similar tone as Siddharth who can't get their films out. And these are films that go to Cannes and Venice and really top-level recognition around the world that they're not recognized. So I think Siddharth right now fits into the moniker of art film, even though here I think it's just a normal film. I mean, it's, there's nothing crazy about it, right? Um, so I don't know in terms of what I call myself, um, where I sit on this. Technically, Siddharth is not even a Canadian film. It wasn't classified as a Canadian film by the CRTC So because the two leads are Indian citizens. Uh, so th- I don't know if this belongs to like um, Martinique. I don't know. If somewhere in the middle, we'll put it. Who <laughs> Some, knows? Somebody will claim it. Somebody Some will country claim it. will yeah. claim it. It's at some point, somewhere in the middle. 
Um, now, uh, you've said in talking about the, the bigger glossier, the Bollywood films and the Masala films, that they've moved away from p- de- depicting common people. Is that is that true? Yeah, I mean, you know what? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, who, who has the buying power in India. So, again, 70s and 80s, you had films uh, where the, the labor class, the rickshaw wallows, were going to see these films. And so the heroes that the stars would play were, were laborers like the the baggage handler at the train station, the kulis they call them, or the um, the coal miner, for example, uh, or the milk farmer. You had the, these Bollywood films about these issues because they were the people going to see the films. Then you had emergence of middle class when India opened up post kind of socialism. And now the people who have the buying power are much wealthier. And so now the films show this kind of um, upper middle class, people who go to New York and go to Switzerland and go to London and go to Paris. And, and now the rickshaw wallows are kind of alienated. They watch a lot of these films, but it's not, it's not made for them anymore. Um, and as a result, I, I, I question the relevance. They're purely entertaining, and that's fine, but they're not for me. Uh, I, did you read the book Behind the Beautiful Forevers by Catherine Boo? No. It's um, set in a slum in Mumbai, and she talks about um, it was. Uh, it started out as a story for the New Yorker. Uh, mm-hmm. It was in the slum, I think, where Slumdog Millionaire was set, and she talks about sort of the two Indias. The slum is right by the airport, and talks about sort of the the modern, new, moneyed India, sort of speeding by mm-hmm. this very poor, invisible mm-hmm. India. Um, and is that, so are you, you mentioned before that you're seeing this greater and greater divide. Oh, for sure. And do you think the people that were already um, uh, struggling the most, do you feel like they are more invisible, um, more silent than you know, before? It's, or it, It's strange. Uh, like one of the, pro- the project I'm really focusing right now on um, has a lot to do with the police in India, uh, policing that society. And I've been te- dealing with a lot of the police in Delhi, talking to them about issues. One of the things they said is happening, which is really fascinating, is for the first time, uh, indentured, like, ser- indentured servitude in terms of like uh, maids and house- household help uh, are starting to murder their masters at an alarming rate. Because before, and, and everyone has them, middle class and even lower middle class has the cook that comes in, just does some work for half an hour and leaves. Um, now they're starting to see there's more money in society, literally more cash floating around, they're getting none of it. And they're seeing their masters flaunt it. And the humiliation is not something they can handle. So they, they literally are stealing and murdering. Um, at I'm, not, I'm talking about thousands and thousands in the city. It's shocking. It's shocking. And it's interesting. And I think it, it kind of speaks to what, hmm. what you're saying. Um, it, it's not my position to come in and say, this is wrong with this society. I'm, I don't live in India. Um, but what is relevant to me is how, how can we take examples of what's happening there, which is so in front of you, so blatantly visual and visible, uh, and, and now apply that to everybody. I think with Siddharth, um, you, you, you watched it and you've, you found a, a, a way to relate. Yeah, I was saying to you before that my son is the same age as the boy that goes missing in the film, and so it was very, uh, it was very wrenching um, because there was this sense of connection with the little boy in the movie. Yeah, which is obviously, and that's I could have changed it to any universally recognized emergency, but this one is so universal. Any parent or any kid, for that matter, could probably find a way to relate, um, and that to me is really important because I want people to look at something like this and in the beginning almost like a science fiction film say i don't relate to this world the light is different what this guy is saying and doing is different the clothing is different i don't really know what's going on and then over the course of the film by the end it's like i completely relate to this this is my world and what happened to this guy is not in a different country it's part of our system and that to me is far more relevant that it's not just an indian thing well, it's, it's interesting that you made the comment about sci-fi, and I, I uh, just because I know that you have an interest and a background, and you've yeah, in yeah, yeah. science fiction, um, and this film has a real neo-realist uh, look to it and feel to it. I mean, it feels as sort of pared down as you can get mm-hmm. from science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, you talk about sort of almost the approach being like a science fiction film, in which you're dropping viewers into a world that they're not familiar with. Mm-hmm. So do you imagine that the audience for this film is an audience, is a non-Indian audience? Um, I mean, it, I, that, that's, that's usually a question that I answer to, like, the distribution slash marketing company in the very beginning. Who's your audience? And I always say well, the audience is me. I, I, find my, uh, I find that I like all kinds of cinema. But uh, in this situation, I think Indian audiences will look at this and say, yeah, I know all these issues. 
as opposed to somebody from abroad. What Indian audiences have picked up on, which is very touching to me, is they have not seen compassion shown like this on screen amongst people. And that's very important. So to me, it is actually for everybody. The last thing I want to ask you, um, how have the, making these films changed you creatively? And obviously, these are very, uh, your work is very emotional too. So how, how particularly something like, like Siddharth, how does, that, how does that shape you to have made this film and been through that process and, uh, and, and held this, this story for that long? Uh, it is, I think it's done so in a very uh, profound way. Um, it's one of the reasons I stick with the movie for a while. I, I like to follow it for about a year and screen it around the world, see how people talk about it and consume it. Um, and uh, for me, uh, it's, it not only does it directly lead to the next project somehow in terms of an experience, um, but there are, I'll look back at the film. Sometimes I'll do things instinctively with my team. We just do things because they feel right. And then a year or two later, I'll look back at it and say, why did I do that? And then I say, I realize, okay, this is why I did it. Uh, one of my favorite shots in the film, which I only found out about a year later, was one of my favorite shots in the film, uh, is a very quick shot in that montage where the chain wall, it was, he's teaching his wife how to fix chains. And um, there's a very quick shot of a fruit stand in a massive marketplace. And it's kind of sun setting in the background and people everywhere. And the, one of the fruit stand guys waves to one of his friends who's just leaving and he smiles. Now that fruit stand guy is the typical example of a mugshot I would see in the news of a scary gang rapist who I never want to see. And you see him smile and say bye to his friend because he sells apples and his friend was there buying some apples. And it, I look at that and it's, it, it really truly warms my heart that, that, we, that, I can, um, that I can see that. And so that is actually, that shot has inspired me in a whole different way on my next project, which is about gang rape. And not, I'm not trying to humanize the gang rapist. Don't get me wrong. What I am trying to do is humanize the people that have to live with that so that we don't actually look at that and say, oh my God, what's happening in that society? Because if they're as appalled as we are, then it's our issue too. Well, and it sounds like when you make your films, you're not making a film about an issue. It sounds like you're exactly you're not making a film about gang no. rape. You're making a film about the people of India. Yeah, and, what and, and, and you know what? I mean, coping, resilience, things like... In Siddharth, it's, it's like, let's take something that's so terrible, and even with the next film, and, and see how people can actually endure. Because I think that is a skill that, a, that we can never be reminded of enough, and it can never be reinforced enough. And I do feel here, um, it's starting to erode. Thank you so much, and congratulations on the film. Thank you.